much. It's for me a great pleasure to be invited to this uh, very, very interesting and pleasant meeting. So uh, without hesitation, let's go into a new subject. Well, as you see, uh, we would like to measure intangible. That this is a new subject. For me, it started uh, three, four years ago. And I, you can see from the list of collaborators that <coughs> it became very popular among uh, our uh, uh, connections. So I've listed them all. And not, I mean, I will not show all what is done, but uh, I will show you some specific results. But, you know, without uh, uh, hesitation, let's address a very specific problem. So I want to show you, the idea is to bring uh, elements of scientific methodology into macroeconomics. Usually physicists approach uh, finance uh, or crisis or, uh, you know, breakdown and so on. We want to do something different. We want to address uh, the question of uh, growth, uh, even sustainable growth. I would say a few words since this is such uh, an important subject in this, uh, in this ambience. And so let's ask a, a specific question. So I show you with an example, what do we mean by introducing uh, specific scientific elements? So the question I've learned uh, a year and a half ago in Amman at this meeting of the task force on industrialization. The question is very simple and very important. You know, we have uh, sub-Saharan countries, 12 sub-Saharan countries. Will they have a chance to become industrial to some extent, like for example today Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, and so on? This is the question, very concrete, very important. This question today is uh, studied with this report by the International Monetary Fund and another institution in Africa. So this is the state of the art of such a question. Will sub-Saharan countries have a chance to become partly industrial? So this report is very long, as you see, 200 and more pages. And what do you find in the report? Just to give you a glimpse, a visual glimpse, you find a hell of a lot of data. There are more than 100 pages like this. In this you find data, for example, the blue line is the average export of sub-Saharan countries compared to the average export of early developed, er, early developed countries compared to some other group of countries. Now, after you get 100 pages like this, uh, you see, what do you draw as a conclusion? That's the problem. And so the conclusion is to the eye of the observer. So you may think that the upper right corner is more important than the left, or next page will be more important than this, and so on. So in a way, you have a big data problem, you have a lot of data, but you don't have a synthesis. And uh, every economist may have a different opinion to which are the important data. These I would call pre-scientific. I mean, you have information, but you have also a lot of noise and not a single conclusion. So if we approach this problem in our perspective, we have just one slide with one solution, which is, and the solution is not, the conclusion is not to the eye of the observer. What do you see here? Here you see the vertical axis, which is the GDP per capita, how much money you make, and the horizontal axis, which is a new variable, the fitness, which we propose to introduce, which means how good you are in industrial wise, I mean, what is the level of competitiveness of your industrial capability as a country? The trajectories you see correspond to 12 countries. The blue are the 12 sub-Saharan countries for uh, the range 95 to 2010, and the reddish are the early developers, which could be a model for sub-Saharan countries to go along, to go in the future. So the two groups are basically disjoint, but, but there are three exceptions, so Kenya, Senegal, and Uganda. You see, so this would be our conclusion, it's just one. No, not to the eye of the observer, it is just a, a simple synthesis of all those 200 pictures. How do we do this? Of course, uh, this is like a physical theory. So we have constructed a story which gives one result. Of course, it could be wrong, <laughs> obviously, and that's what one has to care. So the way to do this is to start from some data, the data are C are countries, K are capabilities. I mean, capabilities would be everything you dream to be competitive industry-wise. For example, education, transportation, pollution in negative terms, uh, uh, justice, uh, whatever, okay? And P are products. Now, what you would like to know, of course, is K. I mean, P and uh, C and P is easy to know, countries and products, but, but how do you measure K? What you have seen before is precisely an analysis of K. I mean, you can study 
you know, what um, education in a certain country, but then you have to put a mark. And how do you some education plus or minus pollution? And all problems like this. These are today in macroeconomics uh, how things are done with about 100, 150 parameters per country. So the first idea of our big data problem is to eliminate data. This is maybe be a shocking. So we eliminate the K, the one we want to compute. Because we argue that the, all the information, the synthetic information on the K, is actually, uh, is actually included into the set of P. So the idea is, as uh, in finance you argue that the price of a stock discounts all the information you may have on the stock, here we argue that the set of products that the country is able to produce is in a way a synthesis of all the capabilities that this country has properly integrated. So we don't have to care. Of course, you know, the idea that you eliminate what you want to compute may appear magic, but you will see that there's quite a logic. Of course, the question is how do you do it? I mean, assuming that the, can the, the products really do contain this information, you need some type of uh, mathematics or some methods to extract it. And this was the challenge. But before we go into this, uh, let me show you what, what we have in our hands. I mean, we have the United Nations data on which country produces which product. And then uh, if you list this in, in a matrix, uh, here you have in the vertical axis, you have the countries already ranked in terms of their fitness. So in, uh, in up are the most competitive countries. And on the right side are the most uh, complex products. As you see from the top right, the most competitive country happens to be Germany. Austria is pretty good. Uh, I will show you some property of Austria. So uh, it produces the very highly competitive products, which means we are talking about the upper right corner. However, Germany also, you know, it, there are points all over the line, the top line. So Germany also produces very simple products, medium and very, very simple. So this means that uh, uh, diversification is more crucial for country development than specialization. And this disproves just this visual impression of products, uh, of, the, of the data. This proves uh, one of the theses which have been going around uh, for a long time, which is that countries should become specialized, as argued by David Ricardo and many, many others. So in this respect, uh, a country is more like a big forest in which there are lakes, uh, there are animals, there are plants, you know, it's like a complex ecosystem. On the contrary, as you see in the bottom, companies are like single animals. So in a way, David Ricardo is correct for companies. Companies have to survive before tomorrow morning. They have to eat something, I mean, like an animal and they have to compete with their own competitors. So the equilibrium of the country and of the company in this perspective is completely different. Today I will discuss the equilibrium of the country, which is the more like an ecosystem. I hope next year we can talk about the companies which are underway under study. Of course, uh, uh, having said all these nice things about uh, you know, a country economic system as an ecosystem, evolvability, adaptability, the challenge is how to go from these words, from these comments, to a quantitative story. Okay, the idea is then to complement money, I mean, uh, money information, I mean, we, which is the standard one, with something new, which is uh, how good you are. The comparison of the two, you see, our idea is that uh, the information on money is static. If you have the comparison, how good you are, and the money you make, if this comparison is positive or negative, this gives a gradient for the future development. This is the idea. So the challenge is to compute uh, the intangible metric, which is uh, how good you are, the, uh, I mean the, the, uh, the fitness, which is the one we, we define. This we do with, the, with an algorithm. I mean, the first attempt was uh, by other authors was done uh, trying Google-like algorithm, you know, the page rank and so on. And uh, our little discovery was that this is not really appropriate for economics. Of course, there are big discussions on which algorithm is bad and the quality. But I have no time to go through this. You can do into the literature and so on. It's a long story. But believe me, this argument more or less works. The proof that it works is that you have invited me here. So you permit me <laughs> to, to accept that there is some merit in this argument. So I can tell you the consequences. Okay, the first consequence is that, uh, okay, you, well, maybe I tell you two words how it is. 
So uh, the first formula, you know, F, up left, <coughs> is the sum, MCP is whether country C produces the product P, yes or no, and Q is the complexity of product P. So you have an extensive measure, you sum all the products you make, and you weight them by the complexity of the products, okay? That's relatively simple, but it is important to have, uh, for example, to have the extensiveness. For example, a Google algorithm, algorithm would not have it. So here, since we like diversification, we put this explicitly. The second equation for Q, these are coupled equation for a self-consistent system, finally, is uh, the complexity of the product. So the basic idea is if everybody is able to make such a product, it means it does not work much. So it's one divided uh, everybody is able to make. But then there is a one over F in the denominator, which has the sense that uh, if, uh, for example, look at the lower part, if you have chips, computer chips, uh, high tech thing, and it's done by US, Germany, and China, these are all high level countries in terms of fitness. So the one run of the algorithm would give a relatively high level of complexity. But you know, if you have like nails, simple nails, which are also done by USA, Germany, and China, but they are also done by Nigeria, if you would have a linear algorithm, this wouldn't change much. Nigeria would just add a zero to the others, but it would change 20% the total average of the fitness of, of the guys who make nails. So we argue instead, uh, if nails can be done by Nigeria, who cares that can be done by Germany? So the important information is the lowest level country that can make nails. If you accept this point of view on economics, you find out that this uh, formula on the right is pretty reasonable and does this job. Just to give you an idea what are the guiding lines. And this is completely different than the Google page rank, for example. Okay, now we can go into some result. So the first result is the poverty trap. Here is a plot of uh, diversification on the ashisa, on the uh, vertical, and uh, uh, fitness on the, on the x-axis. You see that uh, the behavior in, on the right, the steep part of the curve, these are real countries in 1910, like in uh, 2010. So the steep curve on the right means that you have a complex economy with, you know, very, uh, combinatorial uh, nature of the products with respect to the capability. This means that if you are on the right side, the steep part, and you increase a little bit the fitness, for example, you invent the laser, then on the vertical, you raise a lot the number of products. That means with the laser, your combinatorial uh, economics can make different products. But if you are in the so-called poverty trap, it means that you live by growing a couple of potatoes per day. If you increase a little bit, you may eat three potatoes, but this doesn't bring you into an industrial economy. What is interesting, that's the reason it is a flat curve and it is a much steeper, the industrial region. So this here you see in vitro a little bit the phenomenon from the industrialization 1710 for the whole planet. So this you see country by country. What is interesting here is that we are able to define a threshold, so the point where the two curves cross is the level of fitness to go from pre-industrial, from poverty trap into an industrial society, which is pretty interesting for many of the questions that have been uh, discussed uh, in the previous talks. So this is one of the results in which we can put some quantitative element into an important point uh, which often is only discussed at the qualitative level. Let me show you something else. Uh, a test we made pretty soon, this is two or three years old, one of the first tests is about the BRIC countries. I mean, the left part is just the total GDP, and this is one of the elements by which the president of Goldman Sachs in 2001 uh, argued that the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, will dominate the world economy for the next 50 years. This was 2001, so we should be completely in the middle of this domination. But Bloomberg News, a few days ago, argued that, uh, you know, the Goldman Brick era is ended uh, and even the fund uh, has been closed with big losses. So on the right, we have the analysis of the fitness, uh, you see, for these countries. And as you see, while the GDP appears reasonably similar, I mean, all are nearby in the top and they seem to go positive, I mean, to grow a bit, uh, here you see that China is totally different than the others, I mean, India is medium good and Brazil and Russia are pretty bad. Not only they are split much more than the GDP, but the trend is also uh, quite different. So uh, the dashed line shows you that already 10 years ago, we, 
having the idea of the fitness, if you could have computed the fitness, you would have reached the conclusion that now, sadly, uh, Goldman Sachs has found a few weeks ago. So it means that this information is not discounted by, most, by the majority of the, the economists, and that it can really add something new to your uh, analysis. Next. Okay, we can do analysis of many things also. Of, we are doing analysis of regions of China. We could do cities. I mean, cities are big cities and so on. Companies we cannot do and we hope to do uh, in the near future. A basic diagram is precisely, you see, the diagram in which you have in the vertical axis GDP, the one I started with the, with the sub-Saharan, and the, on the horizontal, the fitness. Now, the diagonal line is a sort of average equilibrium line. It means that roughly, if you are on that line, you, the GDP you have is reasonably coherent with your level of industrial capability, with your level of fitness. So let's focus on a couple of outliers. On the right uh, bottom, you see China. You see the, uh, very much an outlier. It means that in 95, China had a huge level of fitness with respect to a very low level of GDP per capita. This means that China had an enormous potential of growth as it, as it did happen. On the upper left, you see a group of three countries, Bahrain uh, and some other, I don't see any other. They are the oil, Oman, and, and so they are the oil producers. And the reason they are up there is that they don't have much fitness, they don't have a great industrial capability, but their GDP is pushed up because of the oil. But above this, you see Iceland, which has a low fitness, a very high uh, GDP, but it doesn't have oil. So Iceland was already gambling with the financial instruments. And what happened was that Iceland uh, collapsed a, a few years later. So, but the collapse is a little bit difficult because, I mean, you can say something is unstable, but to predict the collapse uh, as for earthquake is very difficult. Much easier or much is to predict things which are smooth, so the growth. So in the next slide, you will see all little spaghetti, which are the trajectories of all these countries for the next 15 years. Just focus on China, so upper, uh, lower part on the right. You see, China did exactly what we expected. This this violet line on the, on the right. So China went up a hell of a lot, and this was an information that was uh, also tradable because it was not uh, commonly shared. I mean, some thought it would happen, but some others don't. In the middle, it's hard for the eye to distinguish all the trajectories, so I made a little help for you. I made a coarse graining which means we divide the space into little boxes and we average the trajectories in each box and we define the average as a little arrow. So the arrow is the average of whatever happens into the box. And now you see a new emerging property. We can divide our new space into two zones. The green one is a laminar zone. It's like you have a regular flow of wind, while the left uh, reddish is chaotic. You have an irregular flow of the wind. So this also means that uh, you can have a, a level of uh, forecasting which is completely different in the two zones, and it means you should not uh, mix the two zones with uh, things like regressions, which are very popular among economists. So we propose that things should be considered as heterogeneous. So the, the forecasting should be made uh, for each little box. The fact that with only two variables, you are able to define a regular path in, in the sense of dynamical system in physics, uh, means that the other variables are mostly irrelevant. So this means that if you are in the bottom uh, right part, uh, where, for example, Vietnam is and China is a little bit up, but also on that side, it means that Vietnam, which is in the middle of the green lower part, uh, we can predict uh, that uh, for Vietnam, uh, for example, things like political corruption or crime are irrelevant for their, for their economic development. This may appear magic because we don't know anything about politics in Vietnam, nor we know anything about crime, so how can we make conclusions? We make conclusions uh, in a way in a complementary sense. If the two variables that you are seeing now are enough to define a smooth trajectory, this means that the others cannot be too important. So this I find quite interesting. The opposite cannot be said, I mean, the, the same cannot be said for Nigeria. 
which, where also there is a big crime and people wonder whether this will, uh, you know, will prevent uh, uh, economic development. Nigeria, unfortunately, is in the middle of uh, the chaotic regime. So we cannot say, you know, that this is irrelevant, for example. Of course, I'm talking economic, not morally or, or ethically, but okay, it's interesting, you know, regularity permits you to say something quite interesting. So, in a way, we, we, we argue that this, this type of arguments are similar to weather forecasting. This is uh, North America, the red part uh, is a zone in which weather forecast is pretty accurate, while the blue is a region in which uh, weather forecast is less accurate, because wind, mountains, and local climate are very different. So our argument is that uh, economics should evolve towards a, a type of forecasting which is similar in many ways to the advancement made in the weather forecasting. This story got quite popular. This is a little movie of what you have that was asked by the magazine Nature, which made an editorial of this work a few months ago. Here you see that the right part eventually becomes extremely coherent. And this means that the level of forecasting of the right part is totally different with respect to the left part. Okay, so is, you are seeing just in a little movie the same information I was giving you before. Then, okay, so this, you can read the whole discussion on the various methods. Okay, after this, uh, a lot of people, you know, I got contacted also by many journalists and policy makers, and they asked me about predictions of all types, so I made this to make clear what we do and what we cannot do. So there are people who can make all sorts of predictions. This is a popular figure in Italy, it's the Mago Otelma, who makes predictions of all types. So if you want predictions, you should go to him. What we can do is to make technical measurements. We make technical measurement of the absolute power of your economic engine. We do not know anything about the driver, which is politics, gasoline, which is finance, etc., etc. However, the, the, the engine we measure a little better than before. So this is to make clear. Of course, given that the rest is reasonable and given a certain engine power, you may have a relative I mean, a reasonable forecasting, or if you want prediction, of the speed that this car will go. But this is the sense of our prediction. So, for example, for financial investment, it should be combined with the standard analysis of the other parts. Then we come, I have shown you the brick case, in which, uh, you know, we can see as a back test that uh, the fitness was very interesting. Now we go was the future, so we have to stick our neck. It's too easy to show only the success of the past, so I want to stick my neck to show that we take risks <laughs> when we talk. So there is a paper in Financial Times of uh, the late uh, 2014 that uh, argues what goes up must eventually come down, even China. This paper is inspired by a paper by Larry Summer, who is a very important figure in, uh, in uh, finance and economic in the States and all over and the collaborator, and essentially they argue like this. They say, look, countries grow very fast, like five or more percent, only for a limited number of years. For example, Brazil did it for nine, okay, above five. And then it went to zero, already 20 years ago. Now we have China that did it already for 20. So it must go to zero immediately. That's the argument, okay? So they say the strongest argument is the regression to the mean uh, of, for example, China. I mean, China is an outlier, it already grew too much. Now, this is based on, oh, okay, before this, so we disagree with this. And actually, in uh, Bloomberg, the two opinions are compared. So the first lines refer to, to the view of uh, the Financial Times and Larry Summer, and the second part refers to our work. How we can disagree with so big experts? Well, because we have a, a broader set of information. You see, we can look at things uh, in the plan GDP, uh, GDP and fitness, and this makes a big difference. For example, you can see in the middle here, where near the middle income trap, you see BRA, BRA, and that's the line of Brazil for the last uh, 15 years. Here on the right, you see Ch CHN is the line of China. You can see that the, the tips of these arrows, of this trajectory, are the present value of GDP which are not too different, and Brazil is a little bit higher than China. So the reason that 
what makes a comparison China-Brazil is that the GDP of Brazil is a little bit ahead with respect to China, and so you think that China may be following Brazil. But as soon as you add the fitness to the graph, you would never dream to argue that the line corresponding to Brazil, which is sort of in the middle of what is this middle income trap, you see that China is in no way following that line. So when you enlarge your point of view with the fitness on this plan, you would never dream that China is following Brazil, in case China is following Japan of 20 years ago. Not only, so why did Brazil stop? You see, Brazil stopped because it reached the equilibrium diagonal line a little bit more because it has a lot of raw materials, but basically in terms of industrial capability, it went there. Uh, should I stop? Okay. So, okay, this is the story, and, uh, is an and then China is still quite a way to go on the right side. This is an example of this uh, use in an in actual problem. So, I think uh, I only want to show you these are forecasting for future developments. This is the spectrum of production of Austria, which is not bad at all, but I think I'm going to stop. I just want to tell you one thing we could do in the future, what we could do in the future together with you is to put, uh, why you laugh? <laughs> it's nothing to laugh. It's to put energy into the diagram as a third direction. Thank you very much.